Right. Hello, everybody. A very good evening and a warm welcome to all of you uh, joining us right now via Zoom, uh, YouTube or Facebook, one of the many platforms this webinar is made available to you. Uh, so welcome on board. After a busy week of uh, BSL elections, vaccination programs and uh, whatnot, today we have the 38th webinar of the first webinar series, which is the one conducted in in English, organized for you by the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. On that note, let me also thank all of you, the members of the Bar, not only for joining us today, but for also connecting with us right throughout and for also cooperating at all times. So on this Saturday evening uh, for the 38th webinar, we have selected an interesting topic, and that is the conflict of laws. To enlighten you on this topic and discuss various aspects of it, we have a very eminent and distinguished panel of experts who have taken time off their busy schedules to make a valuable contribution to today's discussion. It's my privilege to welcome the panelists of today on board and of course, uh, introduce them to you all. Right, so first let me introduce to you uh, Professor M. Sornaraja. Professor M. Sornana Raja is an Emeritus Professor of Law at the National University of Singapore. He taught law at the University of Ceylon and at several universities in Australia, Canada, UK, and India. He's also an attorney at law. Welcome on board, sir. Uh, next, we have with us Dr. Joe Silva. Dr. Joe Silva is an attorney at law and a senior academic who has taught law on undergraduate and postgraduate courses in higher education institutions in Sri Lanka and in England. He also served as the principal of the Sri Lanka Law College for over 10 years. Welcome to today's webinar, sir. We also have with us Reverend Dr. Noel Dias. Reverend Dr. Noel Dias is a chaplain to the Catholic Lawyers Guild. He's also a lecturer at the Sri Lanka Law College and the founding and consultant editor for the Sri Lanka Journal of International Law. He's also an attorney at law. Reverend Dr. Noel Dias, we are happy to have you on board, sir. Our next panelist is Dr. Pratibha Mahanamaheva. He is the Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Technology, Jamaica, West Indies, adjunct professor of the John F. Kennedy University, USA, founding dean of the Faculty of Law of the Kutalawala Dickens University, Ratmalana, senior lecturer in the University of Colombo, and a former lecturer of the Sri Lanka Law College. He is also the local team leader for the LLM lecture panel in the University of Cardiff, UK, and University of Birmingham City Campus, UK. We welcome you, sir. Next, let me introduce to you a panelist, Ms. Shahida Bari, who will also be the moderator of today's webinar. Ms. Shahida Bari is a senior state counsel and a barrister at law. She was a lecturer in conflict of laws for the Master of Laws program conducted by the Advanced Legal Studies Unit of the Sri Lanka Law College and a lecturer in conflict of laws at the Sri Lanka Law College. She has authored several journal articles on this subject. In her official capacity, she has represented the government of Sri Lanka at several sessions of the Hague Convention. We welcome you on board. Uh, so this esteemed panel of experts will be speaking to you today on the topic, conflict of laws. I leave you in the capable hands of Ms. Shahida Bari, the moderator of the day. I hope all of you, both the panelists and the audience have an enjoyable and fruitful session. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. Good evening, everybody. A very warm welcome to this BASL ses webinar session on conflict of laws. For those of you who are unfamiliar with conflict of laws, before I hand over to the first speaker, let me just give you a very brief introduction to the topic. Conflict of laws is also known generally as private international law. As you are all aware, different countries and different sub-territories have their own laws, regulations, legal traditions, and so on and so forth. 
inevitably people in these diverse jurisdictions do interact then there will be contracts in which even there will be breaches of contract there will be marriages which lead to divorces there will be other forms of interaction which could lead to accidents and then lead on to delictual or tort claims then subsequently with related to, with regard to such disputes there could there would be judgments from diverse courts from different parts of the world and issues pertaining to recognition and enforcement of these judgments would arise as you can see this is a very broad area relating to private interaction between parties so generally in, in the subject of conflict of laws there are key issues that arise when people between multiple jurisdiction interact and a dispute arises the primary question is often what is the jurisdiction what is the forum jurisdiction to decide upon the dispute then another question that arises is once the forum jurisdiction is decided upon what is the applicable law if it's a contract what is the law that will apply if it's a delictual matter what is the law that would apply if it's a marriage or divorce what is the law that would apply then once that is decided and once there is in fact a judgment in the hands of the judge uh, of the person the next issue is can will this judgment be recognized in a foreign jurisdiction and can it be enforced so as you can see this is a very wide area and within the sp space of the time afforded to us we will not be able to cover the entire gamut of the subject but we will try to cover the key area so the first speaker in our panel dr jo silva you focus on forum selection and the principles of forum non convenience in the wider subject of conflict of law then the second speaker reverend father dr noel dais will introduce you to the choice of law concept relating to delictual matters then we have professor sarna raja who will follow who will speak on choice of law matters relating to contract and how it relates to issues relating to arbitration and last but not least we have professor pratibha mahana maneva who will introduce you to the concepts of recognition and enforcement of foreign judgment so without further ado may i invite dr jo silva to address you all dr jo silva over to you hello can you hear me yes right thank you madam Good evening, everyone. I consider it a great privilege and honor uh, to be a member of this eminent panel. And also, I must thank the Madam Moderator for giving me the chance to open the innings. <laughs> She made my uh, work very much easier by her introduction to the conflict of laws. my subject today is uh, forum selection forum and uh, forum shopping and forum non convenience as you all know first step in any uh, legal proceedings is to select a forum a court or a tribunal where you would be instituting your action where sri lanka is concerned there is a civil procedure code uh, which lays down uh, how and where you should institute action what i am going to speak today is about uh, the basic principles applicable to under traditional common law uh, principles this is because sorry excuse me this is because we were all once part of uh, british empire and they introduced legal systems to all their colonies so we are also part of that legacy what i'm going to talk about traditional common law 
principles. Why I say traditional common law, where in England, there are other regimes that have been created by various regional conventions like Brussels, Lugano, and, uh, and uh, European Council regulations. So I'm not going to speak about those. I'm going to speak about traditional common law principles. In England, institution of action is fairly straightforward. Under the traditional common law principles, all what you have to do is to serve what is now called the claim form, or earlier the writ, I think Sri Lanka I would call it uh, uh, the, uh, the summons, on the defendant, when the defendant is present in England. The presence does not mean that uh, the defendant has to be permanently resident, temporary resident, or domicile in England. A mere present in England would suffice for that purpose. When you see some of the old cases, you find where a person was in transit at the Heathrow airport. The claim form was served. That was accepted. And there was another incident in the famous case of uh, Maharani of Baroda, which all of you know. Uh, she bought some paintings in Paris from an art dealer, which was a fake. And she wanted to file action against a man for recovery of a loss. So she didn't file action in Paris because the entire transaction took place in Paris. She waited till this man came to England because she knew that she used to come regularly to watch races at Escort. So the writ or the claim form was served there. That was accepted. Now you might find this rather odd, right? Because now it, the parties concerned may have nothing to do with the British court, English courts. They may be complete foreigners. The matter in dispute have nothing to do with the English courts. But if the claim form is served, the English courts accepted jurisdiction to hear the case. Only grounds on which the earlier courts would decline or order a stay proceedings was on the basis of either it was oppressive or vexatious or uh, uh, abuse of the proceedings. It was a very narrow window through which a person could ask for a stay order or for the court to decline to hear the case. Uh, so that this is, uh, uh, as at one time, Lord Denin observed, he said, uh, if the shop is open, if the quality of goods is good and the uh, service is speedy, why not English courts? Because England used to make a lot of money by hearing these foreign cases. However, after some years ago, this attitude towards foreign uh, cases changed as a result of certain developments in Scotland and in the US. Now they developed a concept called Forum non-convenience. That is, they said, if there is a forum, a court, where, excuse me. Where this case could be heard, without 
causing prejudice to the complainant or claimant, you must look for that other forum. Now, this took a long time, about over 10 years, for this develop, uh, this uh, concept of forum non-convenience to seep into the English legal system. The ultimately, the, the, the deciding, most deciding case was the case of, <coughs> sorry. Sorry. So now the test is to decide whether there are a forum convenience or non convenience, that there must be an available forum. Secondly, it must be the appropriate forum. The available forum is where the claimant as of right can institute that action. As of right means that is the court where the court normally takes up cases of this particular nature. And also where there has been a clause in the contract specifying the forum. Secondly, it should be the appropriate forum. Appropriate forum is where there is a real and substantial connection with the court or the forum where the action is filed. So now the factors that to be taken into account in this connection are where the parties reside or domicile, where the transaction took place, the law applicable and host of other relevant factors. Once this is established, prima facie, a case is established that there is another forum where this could be heard without prejudice to the claimant, then the claimant could show, yes, there is a prima facie case to be heard in other forum, but by going to that forum, it might cause me prejudice due to various reasons. One reason would be long, long delays. Another would be where the environment is hostile. If I go, I might get arrested. I might, uh, I'm involved in various, uh, uh, say, activities which is not uh, uh, acceptable to the government. I might get arrested, so I don't want to go there. So these are some of the reasons. So in that case, what the court would do is weigh the various factors for the forum non-convenience and also the other factor that where he says that he can't go to this other alternative forum. So now let I, so I will just mention two cases. One is uh, the famous uh, case, but it is not very much mentioned in some of the law books because it's from this admiralty case. It is an action in REM. Again, this ship called uh, uh, Jalakrishna, which is, I think, in uh, Lloyd's reports, where explosion took place on this ship, which is registered in India. And uh, a seaman, uh, one of the seamen got badly injured. And he instituted action in England when the ship docked there in action in REM. So they served uh, the writ or the claim form on the ship. So
so when it was done the ship owners took up the position that england is not forum convenience is not forum convenience is uh, is not forum convenience is not he said there's another forum sorry sorry for the disturbance uh, there was another forum that is india where the parties are because the, the claimant is indian the owners are indian so therefore to uh, the best place the appropriate forum is india then the claimant the seaman took up the position yes team of sca there is a place but if i go there in india the action will take a long long time more than 5 years i am badly hurt i immediately need money for my medical uh, treatment so i appeal to the english court to hear the case and it decided that english court could assume jurisdiction similarly in another famous case of course it was settled out of uh, i mean running short of time yeah yeah so you can fit maybe in another minute or so or more ah yes so yeah again as you all know heard about this famous bopal incident where a plant operated by union carbide one of their tanks leaked toxic gases 2000 over 2000 people died and a large number of people thousands of people got ill as a result of that and then to uh, make a story short where the indian government took up the case and filed action in the us and the best interesting part was indian government representing the victim saying us is the best place in our country the case has take a long long time right and this and whereas in the, uh, the union carbide corporation that em, uh, em, employed indian lawyers to say the india is the best place so these things to take place and these are very complex issues ultimately this cases settled out of court something like 430 430 million dollars which the victims are still waiting to get from the indian government <laughs> so thank you very much sorry i could i have to make it and there were so so many disturbances thank you so much presentation and unmute May I now, Reverend Father Dr. Noel Dias, to speak yes. to the audience? Thank you. Yeah. Can you uh, see the screen? Not are you able to? Are you able to see the screen? Uh, we can see you, uh, Reverend Father, <laughs> but not your slides. Uh, how is it? Still no slides, Father. Is it better now? Share. No, your screen share. Uh, yes, I think it's. Can you yes. see? Yeah. So. Uh, Yes, Mr. Yes. Thank you very much for that very succinct uh, presentation of the the conflict of law principles, which uh, is about jurisdiction, the applicable law, and enforcement of judgments. And my area is law of torts. How uh, the jurisdiction and the applicable law. So I will confine myself to these two areas. Of course, three was meant to be, but our time is short. The first one is about the conditions of action at will in English courts. Uh, for that the wrong would have been actionable if committed in england that must not have been justifiable by the law of the place of commission so therefore there are two consideration must be lex fori lex fori the place where the the case is filed and the other one is about the lex delicti where the, uh, the 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 wrong has taken place so therefore these two conditions must be established of course that we are discussing two important cases so the principles are one uh, that it should be actionable the, the the wrong contemplated must be 
actionable in England. So therefore, in, in, you can substitute our local courts, Sri Lankan courts, in place of English courts. So these are the two requirements. And the place of commission of an unjustifiable act. So therefore, the lex delicti, the, where the action has taken place, that particular action, act or the omission must not be justifiable. So these are the two considerations, but we are not going to deal with the other wrongs coming the high seas about the single ship, but we come can confine ourselves only to the general dealings. And therefore, can you see the, I'm sure, are you okay? Yes, you're so those are the two considerations, the, uh, the conditions of actionability and the place of commission of an unjustifiable act. So these are the two considerations. Uh, so actionability English court, the first question which English courts have answered in the affirmative is whether in any case they should entertain a tortious action based on an act committed abroad. So therefore the issue is if the, I mean, in the, in the instance if the entire uh, action is within in England that conflict rules don't appear. So therefore, there's a foreign element. And therefore, in this particular instance, as uh, the, the tort has taken place outside UK, uh, England, but the proceedings would not be better left to the courts of the country in which the act was committed. So therefore, uh, the, the issue is, if uh, the, the tort taken has taken place outside UK, like you now uh, Dr. Josie Lipa was asking about the the jurisdiction. So the, the issue will come up, is it not better uh, for the foreign courts to deal with uh, this particular tort? But the problem is now there is a foreign element and the forum is the English courts. How are you going to deal with that? The nature of the tort is essentially that of the wrongful act. So therefore, you know that any act, you know, that is criminal liability as well as civil liability. So therefore, from one Act or an omission that could emerge two actions. One is a criminal action and a civil action. We are confining ourselves only to the civil actions, and much can be said in favor of the POD territorial jurisdiction. So, I mean, one would argue that the best uh, place, as like Doctor was telling, the most convenient forum would have been the place where the tort has taken place. But now the issue is that uh, the plaintiff has gone to English courts. And the English courts will have to determine whether it will have jurisdiction first. Having decided that it has jurisdiction, then it will go to the next issue of the applicable law. So those are the two things that we are going to discuss. Do uh, uh, Dr. Mahanama Heva will take care of the enforcement of judgments. I'm not going to deal with the enforcement of judgments. So that is applicable to any kind of judgment, not only about dealing, but even a contractual uh, uh, matter that the, the judgment will have to be. So that is not I'm not discussing that particular aspect. So, furthermore, English court in most cases are entertaining action based on wrongs committed abroad purely by chance. But because of, so therefore, English courts will not assume jurisdiction over a, of a, a wrong that has taken place outside the jurisdiction unless such as, a, so therefore, there should be some link, you know, between the, the defendant, uh, the, the, the plaintiff in this action, such as the nationality, the fact that the parties are resident or carrying on business in England, or if it is a ship, then of course, the, the, it's an English ship. So therefore, there should be some uh, relationship to the forum, though the action has taken place or the wrong has taken place outside. So it is only in this condition that the English court will assume jurisdiction and will seek to apply the applicable law. The peculiar feature that tort occupies in private international law is that when the tortious act has been committed entirely locally, then Lex, as I said, you know, the most appropriate uh, jurisdiction would have been the Lex Loci Delecti, also to take up the Lex Fori. But uh, with it, such as one part is, so therefore, that would have been the ideal situation, but uh, because of its uh, the nature of uh, some link with the English courts, the, though the tort has taken place outside, then the English courts will try to find out whether it has jurisdiction to deal with this matter. In English private international, so therefore these are the two cases that we will be discussing, you know, first of course with regard to the jurisdiction 
and with regard to the applicable law. These two cases are uh, Philip uh, versus Iron. And that, uh, that took place in 18, uh, uh, 1869 to 70. So the, that's the time with this particular uh, Philip versus I came into operation. The other one was in 96, the, almost 100 years later. The first one is more with regard to the applicable law, but the Boyce versus Chaplin is more in the area of assessment of damages. So these are the two cases that we will be discussing mainly, but you know, in between there will be uh, other cases, but the main principles are uh, with regard to delicts uh, pronounced or enunciated in these two landmark cases. Before proceeding with the subject, it would be helpful in its understanding uh, to uh, be briefly, so therefore we are not going to deal with theories that will take, but just for the information, there are three main theories. Uh, one is called the Lex Fori. So the one of the theories uh, with regard to the the, the, the jurisdiction and also applicable to take the entire uh, case before the forum court. Jurisdiction as well as the applicable law. Then of course there is another theory which says the most uh, appropriate uh, court would be the place where the delict has taken place. Still there is another theory called but called the proper law or social environment but uh, Dr. Joe Silva was uh, referring to what we call the uh, real and substantial connection. So there is another principle say the, the appropriate court would have been to find out which, under these particular circumstances, which court has the real and substantial connections. So these are the uh, uh, theories. But in fact, we come back to the main principle that what is uh, enunciated by Philip I versus, uh, versus I and the uh, Chaplin versus Boyce. So our study, our discussion will be centered mainly about jurisdiction. Dr. Joe Silva has briefly summarized the first thing and also Ms. Bari told us, conflict of laws deals with first about jurisdiction. When the, the disputant come and seek the help of the court, the court will have to determine whether it has jurisdiction. And, in, and having decided that it has jurisdiction in this delictual matter, what law are you going to apply? Then briefly about the defenses. So those are the three things that I hope to discuss. So with regard to jurisdiction, of course, Dr. Joseph made us already aware of what we call axionis in rem. So therefore, delict is not an axio in rem, but it is an axio in persona. Since an action on tort is an action in persona, the English court acquires jurisdiction by the mere presence of the defendant. Dr. Joseph already has stated in the famous landmark case of Baroda uh, case, where even a, a temporary visit would, as long as the summonses are served on the defendant, then the court would assume jurisdiction. But of course, subsequently matters have changed. And also there is a Supreme Court rule, English Supreme Court rule, which those days called the House of Lords, now it's called Supreme Court. The rule one it says that when the summonses are served on the defendant, then the court will assume jurisdiction. So there's one particular case of Monroe George Limited versus American Cyanide. Suit was filed with the averments that the defendant company was liable in negligence for selling to the plaintiffs in New York a substance without warning them of its dangerous quality. So actually the origin of this thought was in uh, New York in the USA. But of course the substance was shipped to England when the plaintiff sold it to a farmer who suffered injury. So the effects of this uh, 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 delictual act, uh, the effect was felt in, uh, in England. Origin was in USA, the, the effect was in uh, England. It was held since the alleged thought that the sale of harmful drug without warning was committed in the United States, the leave to serve the writ out of jurisdiction could not be given. So in this particular Monroe case, since the Lex Delicti was taken to be the place where the origin of uh, the act, uh, origin of this harm uh, took place. So following the same area where the, in this uh, Cordova land case, where the alleged fraudulent misrepresentation was in the United States and acted in England, thus completing the tour. So therefore a different view was taken in this Cordova case, where in the first instance it was the, the, uh, the where the delict originated, but in this Cordova case where the, the effect of the uh, uh, delict took place. So I will not stay too long on those 
time is restricted uh, from that jurisdiction matter, I will uh, just uh, one uh, case dealing with uh, uh, jurisdiction. The Privy Council considered the question of in this particular distilleries co company versus Thompson, a similar provision of the New South Wales law came for interpretation and said that what was necessary for the act or omission on the part of the defendant which gave the plaintiff his cause of cause of complaint should have been performed within the jurisdiction. So therefore, it's another case where the, the Lex Delicti, so therefore, the, for the purpose of jurisdiction, the Lex Delicti was uh, considered as the most appropriate forum. So that so much with regard to jurisdiction. And now we will come to this, uh, the two links of the uh, Phillips versus Ayer case. Hmm? Phillips versus Ayer case. The first leg of that, uh, the first leg of this particular, before the, the facts are, of course, is, uh, we will come to the facts little bit. Yeah. So we, I think it be easier for us to start off with the facts. In this Phillips versus Ayer case, in 1865, there was an insurrection in Jamaica, and the governor, Edward Ayer, proclaimed martial law and called out the forces to suppress. During these days, Phillips, the plaintiff, was arrested in the house, handcuffed, put on board a ship, and taken away. So that was the, the delictual, uh, the thought aspect of the uh, case. The, the governor was responsible in the, for the injuries caused to Philip. Uh, after insurrection was suppressed, the Legislative Council of Jamaica passed an act of indemnity. So therefore in Jamaica, where the Lex Delicti has taken place, the legislation made uh, uh, the act of governor immune. And therefore, that was the argument. So after the from liability was done, suppressing the revolt. Governor Ayer returned to England. So when the governor came to England, Philip filed action against him, saying that, you know, he is liable for the injuries that was caused to Philip. On an action for assault and Philip caused imprisonment by Philips against Ayer in the English court, Ayer, the then governor of Jamaica, in the idea pleaded the act of indemnity as an answer to the action. <clears throat> so therefore, in the Lex Loci Delecti, the, the uh, uh, action was uh, not actionable in the place where action took place. This plea was sustained by the Court of Exchequer. So therefore, in this Phillips versus Ayer case, the, in the Lex, Do, Lex Loci Delicti, the, uh, the, the action, it's not actionable. Though it is actionable in UK, but in, the, uh, in England, but in the Lex Loci Delicti, it was not actionable. How many minutes do I have? About two minutes? Uh, Perhaps yeah. about a minute more, Father? Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, so I'll run through it. Minutes. So there will come to the second leg, you know, which is the... Uh, it, it, is, it should be actionable in the place. Of course, there is also previous case where the Philip versus I resorted to similar situation where the uh, for purpose of thought it should be actionable in Lex Loci Delecti and also actionable in Lex Fori. So this double text came to be applied. The wrong complaint of must be wrong not only under the Lex Delecti Commissi but so therefore both, that's a double test for purpose of liability. It should be actionable in Lex Loci Delicti as well as Lex Loci for Lex Fori. So, secondly, that is the, uh, the formulation that was made in beginning uh, in uh, uh, B. There is, of course, a case in Machado versus Pontes, which has now been overruled by Boyce versus Chaplin. We'll come to that. With that, we'll come to Boyce versus Chaplin. Uh, before, so therefore, this is the case where. Uh, both the plaintiff boys and the uh, plaintiff boys and the defendant chaplain were members of the Majesty's arm. Um, uh, uh, they were the Lex Delicti delicti was Malta. So therefore, this defendant, they were army official uh, people. They had some uh, some conflict, and the uh, the plaintiff suffered injuries. They are in Malta. The plaintiff suffered. So therefore, the Lex Loci delicti was uh, uh, Malta. But the issue was now with regard to the assessment of damages. The question before the court was what is the law applicable to assessment of damages? Under the English law, uh, boy, uh, boys was not only entitled to receive expenses, but in English law, uh, he can take medical expenses, the, the, the loss of carrier, all that is connected with that. But unfortunately, in Malta, it was only a, for the medical expenses. It will be about 53 pounds. Whereas uh, if we assess damages in terms of the English 
uh, law that was applicable, he should get about 2,250. But to make it short, eventually, the court held the purpose of uh, assessment of damages, you fall back on the Lex for the, uh, for the for the for uh, the establishment of the uh, uh, for the action. Uh, the, it should be uh, actionable in the Lex Doti Delicti as well as in the Lex, Lex Fori. But for the purpose of assessment of damages, you fall back on the Lex Fori. So thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe if there is time, we can go for other questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father Dias. Uh, may, I, may I now invite uh, Professor Sarnaraja to draw from his vast experience to speak to you on the topic that he has uh, decided to speak to us about, which is choice of law and contracts and arbitration matters. Over to you, Professor Sarnaraja. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Triyali. Uh, my topic today is to speak to you on, uh, on uh, the topic of uh, international commercial law and uh, international contracts. As you know, the uh, issue of international commercial arbitration largely arises from international contracts which are different from domestic contracts to the extent that whereas domestic contracts are made between two people in Ceylon or Sri Lanka relating to matters uh, that concern two parties, which are also Sri Lankan, either a company or persons. In the case of an international contract, there is always a cross-border element that is involved either the subject matter of the transaction is uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Sri Lanka, I'm sorry, uh, either the subject matter of the transaction is uh, in a foreign country or one of the parties is a foreigner to uh, the transaction. The uh, type of contract would largely be something like an international sale tra sales transaction where uh, 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 goods are sold from, shall we say, England to a person in Sri Lanka. So the most usual transaction then would be an international sales transactions transaction, but there are obviously other types of transactions, like, for example, uh, supply of services, uh, the transfer of uh, money from one country to another by banks, so there is a multiplicity of such uh, transactions that become relevant to this subject. So we are talking largely in terms of disputes which arise from international commercial uh, contracts and the manner in which these disputes are settled, principally through arbitration. Uh, in uh, an international contract, one would think that, uh, that uh, the most important doctrine that's uh, relevant is party autonomy. The idea is that the parties that make the contract can structure the contract in a manner that uh, is suitable to their needs. So the notion simply is that the parties have complete autonomy to ensure that uh, what uh, suits them is uh, represented in the contract itself. In other words, they choose the uh, law that uh, is to be applied to the contract. They choose uh, the place where they would settle the dispute. And uh, of course, they choose between litigation and arbitration as to the manner of the settlement of the dispute. So it's, it's very important from the point of view of the settlement of any disputes that arise, that the parties should have a firm idea re uh, reflected in the contract as to uh, where a dispute would be settled, if a dispute were to arise, how it would be settled, would it be settled by, by litigation or by arbitration, and uh, the law that would apply, the substantive law that would apply, to the settlement of the dispute. So three matters are important that the parties choose, uh, 
uh, the place of settlement, the uh, law that applies to the dispute and to the contract, and of course, the manner of settlement, whether it should be litigation or arbitration. The usual method of settlement of disputes in international contracts is arbitration. The, uh, the first matter, if a dispute arises, where is uh, the dispute to be settled is determined by what is referred to as the lex arbitri. So the parties would have uh, uh, indicated in their contract as to where the dispute is to be settled. Because the arbitration clause would contain a reference to the place of settlement of the dispute. The arbitration clause must be a valid clause in a valid contract. There are, of course, important issues of illegality that arise, particularly in uh, places like Sri Lanka, where bribery is very common. So where there's bribery, for example, the main contract would be illegal, but that doesn't mean that the arbitration clause itself would be considered illegal. Unless, of course, it can be shown that the arbitration clause itself was obtained through an act of bribery. So this is an important thing. What uh, you have to show that the contract was a legal contract uh, and that the arbitration clause in it also was not affected or tainted by any illegality. In that case, of course, the uh, forum in which a dispute would be resolved would be the one that is indicated in the, in the uh, uh, dispute settlement clause in the, in the contract. And as I suggested, usually the dispute resolution clause in an international contract would indicate arbitration as the method of uh, the settlement of uh, uh, the uh, dispute. The lex arbitri or the law, the place of the settlement of the dispute is important because of the fact that the courts of the country in which the arbitration is held will exercise control over the arbitration. So if the arbitration is held in Sri Lanka, for example, the courts of Sri Lanka would exercise control over that arbitration uh, to a, a limited extent in modern times. As a result of uh, the Ancitral model law, model arbitration rules, which have been adopted in Sri Lanka as the basis of the uh, latest Arbitration Act, the uh, courts uh, are hesitant uh, are given limited powers of, uh, of uh, exercising jurisdiction over an ongoing arbitration. So the idea simply is that arbitration has almost been given a sort of a free lease in many of the countries of the world and are not as controlled as they used to be by courts in uh, places of jurisdiction. As far as the substantive law is concerned, what is the law that you would apply to the dispute that has arisen? The, the rule simply is that in pursuance of the doctrine of party autonomy, the law that would apply to the substantive issues in the, the, in the dispute would be the law that is chosen by the parties. So it's, it's the tradition that in certain con types of contracts, like for example, shipping contracts, one would ch choose uh, English law because uh, it used to be the practice, it used to be uh, the situation that much of the shipping laws, uh, uh, much of the shipping for that matter, was handled by English uh, shipping companies, that uh, insurance for shipping was done largely by Lloyd's, and, and uh, the form of the shipping contract itself was uh, something that was structured by, uh, by Lloyds. So to that extent then, in certain areas like shipping, perhaps in financial transactions, the, uh, uh, the normal pattern is to ensure that uh, high-end disputes particularly are dealt with in accordance with English law. Uh, the theory being that English law has had the most amount of experience in dealing with uh, high-end shipping matters. 
the parties can choose the law provided they do not uh, uh, use this technique of the choice of law as uh, a method of uh, avoiding the application of uh, mandatory mandatory laws. Like for example, you cannot exclude the tax laws that would apply to the uh, contract by, by choosing uh, the law of uh, a low taxation country. So there are limitations on party autonomy. The most significant limitation being that you cannot exclude mandatory laws. Otherwise, the arbitration tribunal would apply the law chosen by the parties. If no law is chosen, then of course, the arbitral tribunal will construct a law that would apply to the contract by having regard to the different, uh, the different characteristics with which the contract has its uh, significant uh, connections. So for example, if uh, uh, a foreign company were to put up a, a building in Sri Lanka, it's pretty obvious that the contract, uh, the, the, the law that would apply to the contract would be Sri Lankan law because of the fact that uh, the closest connection uh, uh, with, uh, for that contract is with the jurisdiction of Sri Lanka. The building being constructed in uh, Colombo, shall we say, or some other capital in Sri Lanka. So once uh, an award is made, then the question arises as to how the, uh, the award would be enforced. The enforcement of the award is a, a very interesting situation in that uh, wherever the arbitration is held, and uh, of course uh, uh, one can say, say this safely because of the fact that arbitration, the enforcement of the arbitration award is regulated by a convention uh, that was signed in 1958 known as the New York Convention on the Enforcement of Foreign arbitral awards. So this convention has uh, become well nigh universal. You know, virtually every commercial country in the world has signed this contract. Now the principal facet of, facets of this contract are that uh, firstly, if there is an arbitration clause, the convention requires the court in the country where the dispute arises uh, to uh, stay any litigation that is brought in respect of that dispute. So that's the first function on, of the New York for, for Convention, to stay litigation in favor of arbitration if the contract nominates arbitration as the way in which the dispute is to be settled. The second proposition that, that is important is that if there is a award, an arbitral award made in a convention country, that is a country which has signed the New York Convention uh, that I spoke about, that arbitral award can be enforced in any country that is a member of uh, the New York Convention. So shall we say, for example, uh, uh, award is made in Paris in France and uh, uh, somebody wants, it, wants to enforce it against uh, uh, a person in Sri Lanka uh, because uh, he's a national of Sri Lanka and, and has his assets in uh, Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan courts are under an obligation to enforce that judgment, as the, uh, that award, as if it was a judgment of the courts of Sri Lanka. <clears throat> so you can see <coughs> that this is a very powerful technique that has been devised for the enforcement of arbitral award. However, you must also remember that there are defenses against the enforcement of these arbitral awards. There, there are five principal defenses that are stated, and most of them relate not to the wrongful application of the law, but to the wrong procedures that have been adopted by the arbitration tribunal. First, uh, first of the five grounds, and I'll just go through the five grounds which, uh, which appear on uh, that slide. The first uh, of the five grounds, I, the invalidity, invalidity of arbitration, 
uh, and it goes on, the violation of natural justice principles, the excess of jurisdiction of the tribunal, the wrongful constitution of the tribunal, and the non-finality of the award. There are two further grounds which are stated, non-arbitrability of the subject matter and public policy. Uh, do I have time, just two minutes, to state uh, something about, have I, have, have I exhausted my time? You have, but you can proceed for another minute or so, Professor. Okay. The other matter that I want to touch on is foreign investment arbitration. This is becoming of uh, great significance to Sri Lanka because of the fact that we invite foreign investments into our country. And much of the foreign investment that comes into Sri Lanka also is made by, uh, by foreign state companies, principally China. So this, of course, brings a lot of uh, new complexity into the subject of foreign investment uh, transactions, where the dispute is to be settled and how the dispute is settled. The, the principal thing to remember is that foreign investment transactions are entirely different and uh, they are subject to a different regime altogether. So what would happen is that uh, these transactions would contain clauses <coughs> that would uh, refer to specialist tri arbitration tribunals like the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes. And uh, uh, you must also remember that increasingly it's foreign state corporations that come to make agreements with our own state corporations. The, the complexity is added by the fact that, uh, that sovereign entities are involved in the transaction. So uh, this is a, a distinct subject in itself and time of course doesn't allow me to speak so much about it. I thank the BASL for having invited me to present this paper. Thank you so very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Sarnaraja for your succinct presentation. Uh, Professor Sarnaraja spoke to us about the issues pertaining to arbitration. But as you all know, there is a wide array of judgments that will also need uh, the question of recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments, which are not, uh, fall, which do not fall within the realm of arbitration, also become relevant in the sphere of conflict of laws. So may I now invite Professor Pratibha Mahana Maheva to uh, introduce you to the concepts of recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments in Sri Lanka. Over to you, Professor Mahana Maheva. Thank you very much. I quickly start the uh, my area. This is where the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments in Sri Lanka, theory and practice. First, I'll discuss the theory. Uh, they are, after, I will discuss four cases. Now, the enforcement of foreign judgments, what do you mean by that? That is where one jurisdiction, just uh, one jurisdiction gives the judgment and you want to enforce and implement in another foreign uh, jurisdiction. According to private international law, this is basically coming with bilateral, multilateral treaties, understanding unilaterally without an express international agreement. So what is the issue? In UK, the law is very, very clear. Where if you take a judgment in a foreign country and the defendant has insufficient property in that country to satisfy the judgment, if the defendant having property in England, can you implement that judgment? This is the issue. So it has long been practice of English courts, both to recognize and enforce foreign judgments in the circumstances below. So it goes with uh, number one, committee. That is an association of nations of their mutual benefit, yes, you can. Then under obligation. Then enforcement of foreign judgments by action, it comes under several ways. So the conditions under which foreign judgments may be enforced, the judgment must have to be given by the court of competent jurisdiction, action in person. Where it is presence, nationality, voluntary submission to the foreign jurisdiction action in claim where we have discussed earlier. So judgments of foreign courts on domestic states. So final and conclusive judgment, the judgment must be for definite sum. Now, the effect of a mistake on foreign judgments, there are defenses. Now, even a foreign judgment, you take and take the United Kingdom. If it is a fraud, no. Then Disregard the English public policy, you can't do it. The important one is where 
disregard the English ideas of natural justice. Those are the principles. The main concern in United Kingdom, they have three laws. Enforcement of foreign judgments by registration. They have the Judgment uh, Extension Act 1868, the Administration of Justice Act 1920, the Foreign Judgments Reciprocal Enforcement Act 1932. So this is a big basic history of uh, and also the common law principles. Now I will come to Sri Lanka. Now in Sri Lanka, how to implement and enforce a foreign judgment? It is by registration. So there is an act in Sri Lanka. That is the reciprocal enforcement of judgments ordinance number 41 of 1921. Section 3 very clearly says application for an effect of registration of foreign judgment. When the judgment has obtained in a superior court in the United Kingdom, the judgment creditor may apply to the registering court at any time within 12 months. Or even if we can't satisfy that, you have to prove, you have to prove certain evidence why you got delayed. Section 3, subsection 3 is very, very important. Where a judgment is registered under this section, the judgment shall, as from the date of the registration, be of the same force and effect. So the proceedings may be taken thereon as if it had been judgment originally obtained or entered upon the date of registration in the registering court. Now you take a judgment from the United Kingdom and you come and register in Sri Lanka. So it is coming with the originally obtained date with import. So section three, subsection three B provides further that the registering court shall have the same control and jurisdiction over the judgment as it has over similar judgments given by itself, but in so far only as relates execution under this section. Now, in the Sri Lanka jurisdiction, Sri Lanka is a signatory for HCCH, Hague Conference on Private International Law Convention, on the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgment, civil and commercial matters. But there is an issue. The convention has not yet been implemented into domestic law by the Sri Lanka parliament. I think implementation is not expected in the near future. So we have the act, the reciprocal enforcement of judgment ordinance, that is alcohol REGO, provides for the enforcement of foreign money judgments, issues certain jurisdictions, such as Australia, Singapore, and Malaysia. The secondary legislation, which passed in 1926, extended the application of this REGO to several Commonwealth jurisdictions, including Singapore and Malaysia. Currently, there are 54 Commonwealth countries, but not all. So secondary legislation passed in 1926 extended the application of the REGO to several Commonwealth jurisdictions, including Singapore and Malaysia. The secondary legislation was enacted as the rules of the Court of Supreme Court under Section 5 of the REG. Now let's see the procedure, how it works. Now an application for registration for a foreign judgment under the REGO must lodge with the court by the way of application and affidavit. Very important, application and affidavit. In the same way as a summary procedure under Chapter 24 of CDC Sri Lanka. That is where rule number one, Supreme Court rules. If the court is satisfied that the application complies with the applicable requirements, it will issue an order for the judgment to be enforced. Rule number four, Supreme Court rules. Rule number nine specifically say the Supreme Court rules under section 3.2 of the REGO list the ground for refusal of registration of the foreign judgments. That means there is a way you can refuse the judgment. So we will discuss some cases later. Now these are the reasons they are the court can refuse registration of a foreign judgment. Number one, the original court acted without jurisdiction. Number two, that is also very important. The judgment debtor being a person who was neither carrying on business nor ordinary resident within the jurisdiction of the original court. So did not voluntarily appear or otherwise submit or agree to submit the jurisdiction of that court. Then, Third one, the judgment data being the defendant in the proceedings was not duly served the process of the original court and did not appear, despite the fact that it was ordinary resident in the jurisdiction of the court. Thereafter, 
carrying on business within the jurisdiction of the court or agreed to submit of the jurisdiction of that court, the judgment was obtained by fraud. Number two, the judgment debtor satisfied the court either that an appeal is pending or that is entitled and intent to appeal against the judgment. Last one, the judgment was in respect of the course of action for the reason of public policy or other similar reason could not have been in, uh, entertained by the court. So under this ground, REG or section 3.2. So section 3.1 say to register within 12 months and then section 3.2 also gives a defendant, you can basically, uh, uh, you know, refuse that registration. And also Supreme Court rules are also there where I mentioned. So once an application is filed, the court will direct the registrar to issue a summons returnable date on the defendant. On that day, the defendant must appear and show why the judgment should not be registered and enforced. If the defendant fails to appear before the court, the judgment will be extended, entered ex parte after the filing of final written submission by the applicant. So to enforce the judgment delivered in a jurisdiction that is not listed in the REGO, a party must file fresh action before a Sri Lankan court. So the foreign judgment can be submitted as evidence of the claimant's claim. Case number one. This is a very important case. Lalwani versus Indian Overseas Bank, 1998, pre-SLR. So reciprocal enforcement of foreign judgments. What happened? Here, this is where a case, a decision given by judgment of the Supreme Court of Hong Kong. Now, we all know Hong Kong was leased to United Kingdom for 99 years. Thereafter, what happened, it was handed over to China. So the Hong Kong ceased to be a part of Her Majesty dominions with effect from 1st uh, July 97. And could the judgment be registered? This was the basic issue. So the learned district judge answered the issue registration of the Hong Kong judgment in favor of the petitioner responded. So it was contended in appeal that there has been servants of the reciprocity and consequently registration proceeding would have to be terminated as a Hong Kong is now no longer any part of Her Majesty realms of territories outside the United Kingdom. But remember, the judgment was registered in March 1990. That means it was a part of the United Kingdom. So if you go to REGO, it is very clear. You have to accept it. In terms section 3.3, the reciprocal enforcement of foreign judgment ordinance, the effect of registration, very important, the effect of registration on the said judgment is that they had seized foreign judgment from that date, but still it was registered in 1990. So the rights of the parties must be determined as at the date of the action. So since the requirement of reciprocity must only be established when the initial order was made, so its disappearance, by the repeal of the reciprocal legislation in a particular jurisdiction will not affect will not affect the validity of the extension order in favor of the uh, jurisdiction. So what the court said, we accept the submission tendered on behalf of the petitioner respondent and we take the view that learned judge was justified in holding that notwithstanding the change of status of Hong Kong because they properly registered on that day. So that is the decision. Another important case, uh, Alaga Pechetti versus Palani Chetti. So in this case, there was an error in the affidavit. It is very important. So reciprocal enforcement of judgment ordinance, failure to comply with rule three. They are defect in the affidavit. Fatal to application. So the civil procedure code section 384. So when you are submitting as Supreme Court rules earlier explained, you have to go with the affidavit and uh, application. So where a person who applied for the registration of a judgment in his favor under the reciprocal enforcement of judgments ordinance failed to comply with the requirements of section 3. The rules framed under the ordinance regarding essential statement in the affidavit on which the application was based. So it was held that the section 3 of the rules framed under the ordinance was primary and that the defect of the affidavit could not be made ground by inquiry under section 384 of the civil procedure code. So both go together because we have to see the civil procedure code. So what the judges said, we are of the opinion that section 3 of the rules under the reciprocal enforcement of judgment ordinance 
And even if an inquiry was held under Section 384 of the Civil Procedure Court, that inquiry could not supply of make good the original defect in the affidavit, which inquired certain statements should be made by the report. So in this circumstance, we think the order setting aside the registration is correct because there was a fatal error in the affidavit. So the appeal is therefore dismissed with cost. This case is very, very important. Prince Gunasekara versus Associated Newspapers. Now here, the petitioner obtained an ex-party judgment against the respondent company, which was established, registered in Sri Lanka from the High Court of England for damages for the publication of defamatory statement published in a newspaper printed by the respondent and distributed in England by an English company. So basically, the newspaper was printed in Sri Lanka and the distributor was English company. So the respondent did not appear or subscribe to the jurisdiction of the High Court of England. The respondent was not ordinary resident in United Kingdom. Now what happened? There are the petitioners out to enforce the judgment in Sri Lanka, that ex parte decision, under the reciprocal enforcement of judgments ordinance by registering it under Section 3.1. Because once you take that ex parte decision, you have to register to enforce in Sri Lanka, very clear Section 3.1 of the ordinance and order of the District Court of Columbia. The respondent objected. So the Ceylon Newspapers Company uh, objected on one ground. The respondent objected to the jurisdiction of the court to register the judgment on the ground of that section 3.2b of the ordinance prohibits registration in Delia if the judgment debtor was neither carrying on business nor ordinary resident within the jurisdiction of the original court. So it's a very fair argument because the judgment debtor not carrying business in United Kingdom, only a company distributor, no ordinary resident within the jurisdiction of original court. So it was held. In the view of the denial by the respondent, the petitioner should have laid evidence to satisfy the courts that the respondent was carrying on business in the United Kingdom. So the petitioner had failed to discharge that word. So you have to prove this uh, newspaper company carrying business in United Kingdom. So it is thus seen the finding of the Court of Appeal as to the absence of evidence to establish that the respondent was carrying on business within the jurisdiction of the High Court in England is correct. So therefore, what happened, the application for special leave to appeal is according to this. So in Sri Lanka, this case was a little bit recent case, but earlier cases also we have seen all these cases, the registration, and there are grounds for refusal. So the earlier case refused because there were fatal errors in the affidavit. This was uh, refused to register because he was not carrying, the respondent was not carrying business in the United Kingdom. And even you have to satisfy that, uh, discharge that word. So the first one was uh, really uh, respected because even if you have registered the judgment in Sri Lanka, while it was uh, part of United Kingdom at that time. So the last one is not much relevant for my area, but this is also not a registration. Nalaratnam Sirasa versus Honorable Attorney General. This is where this application went to United Nations Human Rights Committee. In the United Nations Human Rights Committee basically said his fundamental rights were violated and therefore pay damages. Not only this case, several cases are there. I'm not talking the registration, but in this case, it was specifically said the constitution of Sri Lanka and the prevailing legal regime do not provide for release of retrial of convicted person after his conviction is confirmed by the highest appellate court, the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka. Therefore, the state does not have a legal authority to execute the decision of the Human Rights Committee to release the convict or grant a retrial. So the government of Sri Lanka cannot be expected to act in any manner which contrary to the constitution of Sri Lanka. So all these things, once again, even the registration, if there are gaps. So registration, basically we go for a claim. We are going for a claim. So that's why we have to see the creditor looking where are the debtor's property. So even if you want to register that, you have to properly satisfy 
REJO principles. And also, we have not signed the uh, convention with regard to that. There are several matters coming. So I am only going with money claim and how to register and get them. So some cases are there in Sri Lanka. If there is a gap, at least we have to see how the common law principle is going to apply. So this is my presentation, a short one. So we can have a, a lengthy discussion when you come to the question and answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Pratibha Mahanaveva, for your discussion on recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments in Sri Lanka. If, if we can now move to the question and answer session, there's one question that has been raised by uh, one of the listeners. It says, what is the applicable law in an online transaction between countries? What is the competent court to solve this kind of matter? Could I firstly put this question to Professor Sarnaraja and then uh, uh, request the other panelists to contribute as well? Well, I, I think the fact that uh, the method of uh, the communication that has been used is of not great significance. The question is whether there is a law that has been chosen by the parties. Uh, and the, if uh, the online transaction or the internet transaction is, uh, has, has been made and uh, the parties exercising their party autonomy have chosen a law, it is pretty clear that uh, it is that law that would be applied. In the absence of a choice, then uh, the proper law, the contract has to be constructed by having regard to the characteristics of that contract and the places where the contract is to be performed or the connections the contract has with uh, the different places. So uh, I think firstly, I would say that uh, that you have to look at the contract, find out whether it has a proper law that has been chosen. Uh, secondly, if no proper law has been construct, uh, uh, chosen, one would have to construct a proper law. That would be my answer to that question. Thank think, you, Professor. The same thing would apply to email transactions or whatever other transactions. I mean, the way by which you you, you co contract doesn't matter. I mean, there is an evolution, like say, for example, you had uh, contracts made through fax when the fax machine developed, contract made by telephone when the telephone uh, thing came about. So new technology comes in. I don't think it's going to sort of alter the method by which you determine the uh, law that applies. The principles will remain the same and the principles would guide you as to how you would choose the uh, proper law of that transaction. Yeah. Thank you. May I add? Uh, may, may I add? Yes, uh, Professor uh, Anamaneva. Yeah. Now, electronic transaction, United Nations Commission for International Trade Law, they introduced 1996 Ancitral e commerce model. All the countries in the world, those who are doing business, they take that law to their domestic law. So most of the countries, even Sri Lanka 2006 Electronic Transaction Act, which was amended in 2017 Electronic Transaction Act. As Professor very clearly said, yes, the forum is neutral. Whether it is online or offline doesn't matter. But it is very clearly say, Electronic Transaction Act, section 11 to section 14, very clearly say, how electronic contracts are formed and also acknowledgement of receipt. All these legal principles are very clearly stated. So many countries are following the same rules. So my argument, this is where if it is an online transaction, it can be face-to-face -face or it can be email. Now, face-to-face -face transaction, let's see you go with uh, uh, bookdepositories.com or any other .com. So if there is anything, Sometimes if the quality is very low, still you can go and complain to Sri Lanka Consumer Affairs Authority so they can also handle it. Now, if you take an implement, big, because electronic transaction, big things are not coming. If, if you come for electronic transaction, it is where simply it says certain contracts you can't enter. But anyway, if you take a judgment, yes, 
the rules are very clear in sri lanka and even a civil law country even many civil law countries in the world not only common law countries they also follow the same rules so they have to satisfy and implement the judgment so in united kingdom they have 1990 uh, implementation of foreign judgment you have to go in that basis so i think adding those two uh, it's very important to see ancestral model law and the country uh, law which based on i know all the countries i think more than 190 countries are based their uh, local electronic transaction act based on the e-commerce model thank you thank you uh, professor manam heva if i can now move to a question that has been raised by the bar association itself in the chat um, icon the question is how to enforce a commonwealth divorce judgment delivered on the ground of breakdown of marriage through sri lankan court would it be against the public policy of sri lanka if not can we apply english common law for such enforcement as there is no statute to recognize a foreign divorce judgment i think if i may distill that question i think that question asks the panel to address the law relating to uh, recognition and enforcement of a divorce decree in sri lanka so may i invite uh, at the outset uh, either uh, Pro professor mahana maheva or father noel das to take that question yes dr das yes you are you have to unmute oh, father mute. you have to you have to mute the mic you have to mute Father, you are mute. Uh, Ms. Bari, now the question is about an enforcement of a decree, marriage de a decree on a dissolution of marriage, is it? If I may read that again, how if to you... enforce a commonwealth divorce judgment delivered yes. on the ground of breakdown of marriage through Sri Lanka courts? Actually, uh, you know, with regard to the enforcement of foreign judgments, the principle is that they will not go into the merits uh, rightly both the section 3 subsection 3 of the in, uh, reciprocal enforcement of foreign judgments the, uh, the the court will not go into the merits of course there is a, a statutory clause about public policy whether they could invoke it i'm not too sure but as far as i know uh, uh, the the matters that prevent enforcement will be only the procedural matters for instance they have not complied with the 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 Audi Alteram Pantem or uh, those procedural matters, that judgment should be enforced. Thank you. As, uh, uh, as I see uh, it, Father, can Professor Mahanam, have yeah. really added to that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I can add. Uh, very recently, uh, I saw International Bar Association uh, IBA conference also. This was discussed. So, this is we are a child adoption case. In a divorce and a separation, in that it was said, no automatic recognition of uh, enforcement of custody orders of foreign courts, except in the context of Hague Convention proceedings. But we have not actually implemented an uh, act on base of that, or Parliament has not passed a law. So in this case, very clearly ask the question whether you can go with the common law principles. Yes, if there is a gap. If there is no convention ratified, then it does not make it as a law. Or even if you if you don't have a legislation, I think uh, you can try with the uh, common law legal principles. So basically, this adoption case which came up uh, in Fernando versus Fernando sometimes back, which was specifically stated, whatever the judgment given in United Kingdom was not uh, directly it was applied. You have to go with the procedure as Father Noel does. Properly said, uh, but we don't have any legislation at the moment. So my argument: you have to try with the common law legal principles. Yes, thank you. If I may add to that uh, issue of recognition of uh, foreign divorces, as uh, Professor Pratibha Mahanama Heva said, the uh, recognition and enforcement uh, law, the statute, may not be of direct application on the issue of marriage and divorce because they don't relate to money judgments and they're not commercial matters. But uh, so therefore the, uh, the, the focus should be on the common law. So on the common law, then one has to consider whether the applicable common law would be the Roman Dutch law or the English law. So 
So under the Roman Dutch law principles, generally uh, a divorce, a marriage, a validity of a marriage would be recognized under um, uh, on the principle of whether the marriage, the the law of the place where the marriage was celebrated. If there was a, if the marriage is valid in terms of the law of the place where the marriage is celebrated, then that would be recognized under the conflict of law rules of Roman Dutch law as a valid marriage. Whereas in English law, there is a dual test. The for a marriage to be recognized under English law of conflict of laws, you have to have the validity under the place where the marriage was celebrated, as well as validity, a concept called uh, essential validity, where the uh, the domicile, the, the law of domicile of the parties have also to be also to recognize the marriage as valid. So that is with regard to marriage. But with regard to divorce, the principles of private international law, or conflict of law, uh, in in the common law rules, um, are traced back to actually a Sri Lankan case called the Lemesserie case, which also forms the foundation of the English common law. But that was a Roman Dutch law case which says that if the, 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 if the court of domicile of the, uh, the, uh, the, the marriage, the domicile of the marriage, if the court of uh, the domicile has declared the marriage as being annulled or divorced, then the uh, Roman Dutch law would recognize it as, as, uh, as if the marriage is nullified. So the uh, divorce decree would be recognized if the divorce decree is emanating from the country of domicile of the parties. So that is the Roman Dutch law. So the answer to the question as to whether divorce judgment uh, will be recognized in terms of our common law, if we can base our argument on the Le Mysterie case and say that the, case, the judgment is emanating from the uh, place of domicile of the people who are married, then I think you can successfully argue that it should be recognized. But of course, there, this is a wide area because this is very old law. And from a human rights perspective, there's this huge debate as to whether the law of domicile should be actually the, the, uh, the basis on which this matter is decided. man, this, uh, the, the husband, and therefore a huge uh, debate uh, re revolves around this issue. But to answer you the basic question, one has to look at the validity of the marriage, divorce in the law of, in the, in the country of domicile. So if, that, I, yeah. if I can add one, sorry, if I can add one, so I have a child adoption case, which the uh, judgment was given in United Kingdom, but it was not uh, accepted in Sri Lanka. So what the court said, what the court said, the respective parents, would have to institute proceeding in Sri Lanka. So that is there. So that is going with the public policy uh, as well. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Mahana Maheva. There's another question that has come up. Uh, how can we choose a competent court in debt recovery matters between countries? Will there be uh, one of the panelists who can chip in to answer that? Professor, uh, Dr. Joe Silva, would you like to take that question? How can we choose a competent court in debt recovery matters between countries? You're on mute, doctor. You're on mute. Professor Swarnaraja? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't think I'll be able to give an answer on that because I have not uh, studied this subject at all, really. Yeah. Any, any, any other panelists would like can to? Can I, uh, you know, now the debt recovery comebacks comes back onto the forum selection, right? Yes. Is that right? So the same principle is competent court. Yes. Co competent court. So therefore, the, whatever the, the matter that is involved, the initial question is about, so the, the, that is where the conflict rules come into operation to find out whether there is a, a jurisdiction for the court. So uh, the, generally, of course, you know, there are wide principles, but we call if it is uh, matters relating to uh, uh, immovable property, Lex Citus. That is the place where the uh, now Madam was mentioning about the matter is the personal law. It will be the law, the lex domiciliary, and the other one, of course. But we the what doctor had been referring to doctor you had been referring to the where the real and substantial uh, connection with the dispute. So therefore, based on these principles, the court will have to ascertain whether it has jurisdiction or not. Thank you.
Yes, thank you, uh, Father Dias, no, for that. Uh, I don't know whether there's, there are further questions, Madam, uh, with regard to the, whether they will need any clarify, any more clari clarifications on that. The person who has asked a question there, can be asked whether he happy with that or whether he has further questions. There is another question. Yeah, those are about. Yes, those are the questions that have been asked. Um, right. There is another question. In in some uh, families, all members died. In a testamentary case, who died first becomes very important. It has to be presumed. Is it the Roman Dutch law, or English law that will that will be applicable? That is whether the strong the. So I think the question uh, as to whether in a testamentary case where there are members of the family. Uh, I, it doesn't quite. This question is not clear. I don't think we can take this question because I it I doesn't. Actually, I can step in. You know, I can step in. You know, there is a. Can I come in? Yes, please, please, yeah. Father. No, uh, of course. I mean, uh, the English law principle. You know that in the event the people die, about the for instance that famous I forget the name of the case where the mother and the daughter died in a plane crash at the same time. So therefore, now the issue was there was a last will. And the last bill was that who takes precedence. So therefore, the English law principle is that the older one, you know, dies first. So apart from that, uh, there is no other principle. Therefore, uh, with regard to testament succession, if the people die at the same time, the older one is presumed to have died earlier than the younger one. There's a decided case to that effect. Only thing I forget the name. Okay, thank you so much, Father. I think that is about, we have covered the questions that have been asked. Uh, so I think we have exhausted our time. We have passed the seven o'clock time, um, the mark that has been given to us. So I thank all the panelists for their useful contributions and taking time off their uh, busy schedules to be part of this session. And I thank also all of those who have participated in this session and the Bar Association as well. Uh, thank you very much thank and good guy. Thank you. <laughs>